morning everyone and welcome to our online service. Let's begin our worship this morning by singing the introit. The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence. Let all the earth keep silence before you. Keep silence, keep silence before him. This morning's call to worship is taken from Psalm 61 verses 1 to 2. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. And now we'll have a time of praise and adoration by Amos and Bianca, followed by opening prayer by Perry. Yeah. 
Dear Heavenly Father, your servants have gathered in mind to worship you. We ascribe to you glory and strength. We ascribe to you glory due to your name. We worship you in the splendor of your holiness. Father, we come to you in confession. Although we claim to have gathered together in mind to worship you, however, many of us do not and have not worshiped you in spirit and in truth. Worship is supposed to be the response of our hearts to your truth. Yet our response is lacking in both elements. It's either we don't respond with our hearts or there is no element of truth. Some worship based on their emotions, whereas others respond with a cold, dead heart that is unmoved by the truth of your word. We come to you ascribing glory, yet our actions during the week reflect otherwise. In our actions, we have not demonstrated our love, our devotion, and our loyalty for you. We let week after week pass without proclaiming your name. We fail to ascribe glory to you, treating your name with contempt. 
we are sorry for our lukewarm worship. Father, we thank you for your patience, your mercy, and your grace. The very fact that we have gathered together to worship you and are in the faith is by itself your grace. If not for Christ's sacrifice on the cross, we would be condemned for destruction. As we come together to worship you, we ask of you to reveal yourself to us. Let your word penetrate our heart and guide our actions leading to true worship. Lead us to repentance. Help us to respond, not as Judas did. For repentance is not merely emotional guilt, but a genuine change of mind and will. It is not perfection that you seek, but a sincere heart. Give us a heart of sincerity. We come to you in surrender. No matter what it takes, we ask of you to imprint on our hearts your image, that life's riches, cares, and pleasures would never erase your work. All these things we pray in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. We'll continue our worship by singing Gloria Patri. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Uh, today we will recite the Nicene Creed together. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through Him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day He rose again, according to the Scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and is with the Father, and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy, universal, and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism, for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to the life in the world to come. Amen. Uh, this week's memory verses are taken from Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 to 10. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. This morning's scripture reading is taken from Jonah chapter 1 verse 17 to chapter 2 verse 6. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swelled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me, seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down, the earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord, my God, brought, me, brought my life up from the pit. Okay, so we are continuing our series into the book of Jonah. And this morning we're up to Jonah chapter 2. 
So the story so far, as we have repeated many times, is Jonah had disobeyed God. And so he got on a ship to run away from God's presence. But God sent a huge storm upon the sea to stop Jonah in his tracks. And the storm was so bad that the sailors decided to cast lots to see who is responsible for this storm. And the lot, according to God's sovereignty, fell on Jonah. So they asked Jonah, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? So that's in verse 11. And Jonah replied, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Because Jonah figures, okay, since he's the one who is responsible for the storm, if they get rid of him, then the sea will become calm for them once again. So that's what they do in uh, chapter 1, verse 15. It says, then they took Jonah and threw him overboard and the raging sea grew calm. And last week, we focused on verse 16, how because of what happened, because these sailors saw the human sacrifice of Jonah rescuing them from the raging storm of God's wrath, these sailors from now on, they vowed to worship Yahweh, the God of Jonah alone, instead of the false gods that they used to worship. And so last week, uh, we talked about the sovereignty of God. We talked about how God, even though he was not pleased with Jonah's sin, even though he was angry with Jonah's sin, God nevertheless overruled and used Jonah's disobedience and its consequences as an instrument of fulfilling his good purposes in saving the eternal souls of those unbelieving sailors. And we talked about how that is actually a picture of the cross of Jesus Christ. How God used humanity's sin. Okay, in fact, the worst sin that was ever committed. right, The murder of God's son to actually bring about the salvation of all believing mankind. Okay, So now, uh, this morning, we come to verse 17 to see what happened to Jonah when he was thrown overboard by the sailors. And this is what happened, it says in verse 17. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now several weeks ago, I mentioned how Jonah asking the sailors to throw him overboard, even though it sounded very noble, right? Because he's sacrificing his life, to save the lives of these sailors on board was actually just another act of rebellion against God on Jonah's part. Because I mentioned how Jonah knew from the prophecies by Hosea that Assyria slash the Ninevites will one day come and invade Israel, Jonah's people, because of Israel's sins. And so I talked about how what Jonah was trying to do by asking these sailors to throw him into the sea was he was trying to frustrate the sovereign plan of God for the world. Because you see, Jonah, he thinks that by him not going to Nineveh and not preaching to the Ninevites, the Ninevites will not have a chance to repent of their sins. And so Nineveh slash Assyria will uh, be destroyed by God. And so Assyria will no longer invade Israel in the future. You see, that was Jonah's idea. That was Jonah's plan. Okay, because we talked about how that's how much Jonah loved his nation. Okay, he was a patriot who, who loved his fellow Israelites more than he loved his God. Okay, so Jonah was willing to sacrifice his life to try to stop God's plan to use Assyria as an instrument of Israel's punishment. But what we see in this verse, in verse 17, is God squashing Jonah's plan into nothing. Okay, as that proverb says in Proverbs 19.21, Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Okay, you see, Jonah thought, he thought that he could defeat the purposes of God by dying, by giving up his life. 
But what we see in verse 17 is that God will not allow that to happen. God will not allow Jonah to die. You see, Jonah thinks he's being some kind of hero, sacrificing himself in order to destroy the future enemies of Israel. But God will not allow Jonah to be a hero. He will not allow, he will not let Jonah have his way. Only God's sovereign will will be done in this world. You see, Jonah does not have any control over his life or death. If God doesn't will Jonah to die, he cannot die. God is the one who decides whether Jonah dies or not. Okay, but let's come to uh, chapter 2. In Jonah chapter 2, Jonah gives us some more detail of what happened when he was thrown overboard by the sailors. You see, on the, on the ship, Jonah was feeling all brave, right? He was feeling all patriotic. You know, he was like, throw me into the sea. I'd rather die than obey God and go to Nineveh and help the enemies of my people. But what we see in chapter 2 is that at the face of real death, at the prospect of really dying by drowning, Jonah realizes that he's not so brave after all. He was all talk on the ship. But at the very gates of death, Jonah begins to get scared. He begins to be afraid. And he, he, he begins to cry out to God for help. Okay, look what he says. Jonah chapter 1. Uh, sorry, Jonah chapter 2 verse 1. From inside the fish... Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. Okay, so what we see here is that Jonah basically, he went down to the, the very bottom of the ocean. Okay, he says he sank down to the roots of the mountains. Yeah, you see, that is not an allegory. We can see that that's actually what happened in the very graphic description of the seaweed that was wrapped all around his head. Like, why mention seaweed if that's not actually what happened? Okay, so what we see here is that Jonah really, literally hit rock bottom. Now, I don't know how deep that water was where Jonah sank. But it usually takes quite a long time, doesn't it, to get to the bottom of the ocean, okay, to get to the ocean floor where the seaweeds grow. See, this is why I keep saying that Jonah probably, okay, medically speaking, did drown and die at one point in this, in this sinking process. Because he must have been underwater a long time to get to the roots of the mountains. But, you know, I did some research... Uh, and this is one, what one scientist says. This scientist, he says, uh, at the bottom of the ocean, there's no air. So, you, so obviously you can't breathe at the bottom of the ocean. If you can't breathe, your body won't stay alive for more than about 30 minutes, although you would lose consciousness after about five. Okay, so it could be that Jonah's body could have stayed alive uh, while he was descending to the ocean floor. But uh, Jonah would have lost consciousness well before that, as it, as it says here. But whatever happened, okay, Jonah's point in today's passage is that he was at least on the verge of death. Okay, like he was literally at the very doorstep of death. And he probably did cross that line into death, technically speaking, for a few minutes. Okay, we don't know, but he does say... He says that from deep in the realm of the dead, I call for help. Now, what I, what I found helpful at this point, for my understanding anyway, was these words 
of this uh, one commentator. And uh, this is what he says. In the Old Testament, death is understood to be more of a process than an event. As for Jonah's place in that death process, life had ebbed so much that he could have been reckoned more among the dead than among the living. Okay, so that's what Jonah means by that. Okay, so what happened was, in the midst of that dying process, while Jonah's life was fading away from him, almost completely, it was in that moment that Jonah finally began to pr pray to God. Of course, his mouth could not pray, his mouth could not utter any words, and his brain was probably unconscious at that moment, as we said. But in his unconscious, drowning state, Jonah's spirit inside of him began to cry out to God, Help! But let me just say something here, right? It's, it's great that Jonah finally began to pray while he was drowning at the bottom of the ocean. But he didn't need to do that. He didn't need to wait until then to start praying. As I said, he could have prayed while he was still on the ship. When the storm was about to break up the ship, Jonah could have said at that point, Please help God. Please help us. And God would have helped. God would have listened to Jonah on the ship and calmed the storm. Jonah didn't have to wait until he reached rock bottom to start asking God for help. He didn't need to be that stupid. But you know, many of us are just as stupid, aren't we? We're just as stupid. We also wait until we reach rock bottom, spiritually speaking. Okay, we go as low as we can go before we start asking God for help. Don't we? But we don't need to do that. Okay, we don't need to go through this miserable experience that Jonah went through. Okay, going to the gates of death itself before we start turning to God. Okay, we need to learn to be sensitive to the voice of God and to the promptings of the Holy Spirit so that we start seeking God when the light storms come and try to shake us up. When the small warnings come from God. Actually, that's not 100% correct. We should go even further than that. Okay, we should be so sensitive to the voice of God and the, 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 the promptings of the Spirit that we turn back to God, especially when there are no storms in our lives. When everything seems to be going our way, even though we are living in sin and in disobedience to the will of God. Okay, it's like Jonah in Jonah chapter 1 verse 3, where Jonah, he just happens to find a ship going the very op opposite direction to where he's supposed to be going. He just happens to find it as soon as he decides to disobey God. Isn't that funny? It's almost like someone's trying to help Jonah sin against God. Well, of course it is. It's the devil. You see, the devil's prowling around like a roaring lion. As soon as we decide in our hearts, as soon as we resolve in our hearts to sin against God, the devil's right there to help us, to supply us everything we need to do that. So you see, it is at that moment, it is when Jonah coincidentally found that ship going to Tarshish, Tarshish that's when Jonah should have repented. He should have repented in chapter 1, verse 3. Hey, Jonah should have been like, this is too good to be true. I want to run away from God, and next minute there is a ship right there that will help me to run away from God. This is surely temptation from Satan. And so Jonah should have immediately turned back to God when he found that ship, and he should have said, God, Please forgive me. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from the evil one. 
He should have said that when he found that ship. In the same way, we don't have to wait until we reach rock bottom before we seek God again. We don't even have to wait till the storms come. Before the storm comes, when everything's going the way our hearts, our sinful hearts desire, that's when we got to wake up. Because we're getting baited by the devil. Okay, so yes, Jonah, he should have prayed while he was on the ship. Not while he's drowning to death. Not while his lungs are being filled with water at the bottom of the ocean. But at least, at least Jonah is finally praying. And not only is Jonah praying, he's praying a prayer of faith. Okay, look how Jonah prayed to God as he was dying. He says in verse 4, I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. Now, one thing you notice about this prayer is just how positive it is, isn't it? It's so positive. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. You know, when I first read that, I was like, how does Jonah have such audacity to say such a thing? I mean, how dare Jonah say that? I will look again toward your holy temple. He doesn't deserve that. And how does he know that that's what's going to happen? How can he be so confident? Because it's because Jonah trusts in his God. Okay, in spite of Jonah's sinfulness, in spite of him being severely disciplined by God for his disobedience, Jonah, in the midst of all his imperfections, was someone who genuinely trusted in God's mercy. He really believed that God will somehow get him out of this situation. He believed it. Okay? Not because he's worth it, but because he knows who God is. A gracious, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love kind of God. He really believed that. And because he knew that God is still his God. And that he is still one of his people. He knew that God will not ultimately leave him or forsake him. Jonah had faith in his God. Even while he was drowning to death because of his sins. You know, the other day, um, during our Zoom Bible study, someone asked this question. Will we see Jonah in heaven? And I said, uh, I hope so. But actually, the correct answer is yes. We will see Jonah in heaven. We will. We will meet him in heaven despite Jonah's disobedience and all the, the silly things that he does in this entire book. We'll see him in heaven. Why? Because, you see, it's not the, the righteous that go to heaven. Why? Because there is actually no, no such thing as a righteous person. There's none righteous. No, not one. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. We know this verse. Okay, there's no such thing as righteous people that deserve to go to heaven. Only wretched sinners who have been justified and counted as righteous because of their faith in God. Okay, just like Abraham. Genesis 15 verse 6, And he, Abraham, believed the Lord, and he, the Lord, counted it to him as righteousness. How do you think Abraham went to heaven? Because he was righteous? No, because in spite of his sinfulness, Abraham was a person who trusted in God. And that trust was counted to Abraham as righteousness. Okay, it's the same thing with us in spite of all our sinfulness and all the, the silly things that we do, just like Jonah. The question is, do we trust in God like Jonah did, like Abraham did? Do you trust God? Do you have confidence in God? Because you see, that's what God is looking for at the end of the day. He's looking for faith. Faith is what pleases God. Faith is what glorifies Him. 
And if you do trust Him, then you are righteous in God's eyes. Because by faith you have Jesus Christ's own righteousness imputed to you. That's the doctrine of justification by faith. Okay? But coming back to this prayer, another question that arises is, okay, but how did Jonah uh, speak like this? How can Jonah be so optimistic? How can Jonah be certain that God will be merciful to him? In other words, uh, what I want to ask here is, where did Jonah get this kind of faith and confidence in God? Well, let me tell you, it didn't come out of a vacuum. Okay? Jonah didn't pull this kind of faith while he was dying out of thin air. Jonah was able to have this kind of faith, this kind of optimism in God, because Jonah knew his Bible. And especially because he knew his Psalms. Okay? Notice how similar Jonah's prayer is to these Psalms from Psalm 31 and Psalm 18. I said in my alarm, I am cut off from your sight, but you heard the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cried to you for help. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice and my cry to him reached his ears. You see, if you know your Old Testament, you notice that Jonah's entire prayer in chapter 2, from beginning to the end, is not very original. It's not very original. Jonah's prayer is basically a mishmash of the book of Psalms from all over the place. Okay? Every line of his prayer has a cross-reference to some kind of psalm. Okay, listen to this. These are all the cross-references. Psalm 120, verse 1, In my distress I called to the Lord, and He answered me. Psalm 42, deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. Psalm 69, when my spirit faints within me, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Psalm 142, I hate those who pay regard to worthless idols, but I trust in the Lord. Psalm 31, I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. Psalm 116. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Psalm 116 again. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. You see, this doesn't mean that Jonah was plagiarizing the Psalms inside the belly of a fish. But what this shows was that Jonah was a man who frequently used the book of Psalms as his personal prayer book. Hey, look how many Psalms Jonah is quoting from here. Jonah was a man who was so familiar with the Psalms. He was someone who had probably memorized these Psalms, or at least he was someone who had so internalized these words of the psalmists So that in his dying moments, as his head was getting wrapped by seaweed, the one thing he remembered were all these Bible verses from the book of Psalms. And the reason why Jonah was able to have such optimistic faith, even while his life was fading away from him, was because in the book of Psalms he read about David. He read about all these saints, all these psalmists, who were in trouble, who were on the verge of death, just like Jonah was. But God rescued them when they cried out to God for help. Okay, so Jonah figures, if God had helped out my forefathers like David, when they cried out to God, when they trusted in God's mercy, then God will surely also help me when I cry out to Him. And so that's what he did. In other words, it was the Bible the Holy Scriptures that gave Jonah faith. As it says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Okay, you want faith? You want increased faith? Then you've got to keep hearing the word of God. Faith comes from hearing the word of God. 
Okay, because what else is going to give you this kind of optimism in God in the midst of your trials? When you reach rock bottom, especially when you reach rock bottom because you are disciplined for your sins. What's going to give you this kind of optimism that Jonah had? Okay, what else is going to give you this kind of hope in God that, that God will not ultimately leave you or forsake you? That God will preserve you? That God will not allow you to be completely destroyed? That God will save you from your backsliding? That He will restore you to that place of worshipping God once again? Okay, what else is going to give you this kind of hopefulness? You see, faith comes from hearing. Faith comes from the scriptures. As you read how God countless times in redemptive history has done the same things for your forefathers in the faith when they trusted in God. You see, if God rescued David out of all his troubles, if God miraculously rescued Jonah by sending a giant fish when he trusted in God, and most importantly, if God did not abandon Jesus Christ in death, nor let him see corruption, but raise Jesus from the dead on the third day because he trusted in his Father, then God can and he will deliver us when we place our trust in him. He will. But as I said, Jonah's faith, that kind of optimism, didn't come out of a vacuum. As a man of God, as a prophet of God, Jonah had spent his entire life reading the scriptures, studying the scriptures, meditating the scriptures, memorizing the scriptures, for him to be able to recall the scriptures at the brink of death. You know, it's like a sponge. When you squeeze a sponge, you see what was inside that sponge all along, right? So when Jonah was squeezed with a life-threatening trial, what came out? Bible verses came out. Hope in God came out. Confidence in God came out. So the question is, can the same be said of you? When you are squeezed by a severe trial, will Bible verses come oozing out? Or just words of complaining? Words of cursing. Will swear words come oozing out when you are squeezed by a trial? You see, you only get out what you put in, right? When you are squeezed by a severe trial, will confidence in God come out? Or just hopelessness and misery? Let us then, like Jonah, and like the saints of all, and like Jesus himself, so internalize the scriptures so that such optimistic faith and hope in God will come out in our time of need. Okay, let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us from the optimistic faith that Jonah had in you. We have learned that such faith doesn't come out of a vacuum. But that for Jonah, it came from the Holy Scriptures that he had memorized and internalized throughout his whole life, especially from the book of Psalms. Help us, like Jonah, to use the Psalms and to use the Scriptures as our prayer book. Help us to pray the Scriptures so that in our time of trial and need, that the prayers of our forefathers in the faith will become our prayers so that we will experience deliverance just like those saints did and just like Jonah did. And thank you for teaching us that we don't have to reach rock bottom in our lives before we start turning back to you. Help us to turn back to you when there are only light storms in our lives. In fact, help us to turn back to you when there are no storms at all when everything is going smoothly, when everything seems to be going our way, even though we are living in rebellion and sin. Indeed, Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And Father, thank you for the reminder that it is, it is not the righteous that go to heaven, but it is people who believe 
and trust in their God. Thank you for this doctrine of justification by faith. Help us in all circumstances to trust in you and you alone, because faith is what you are looking for. Faith is what pleases and glorifies you above all things. Grant us this gift of faith, for indeed it is a gift that is given to us only by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, now let us receive the blessing from God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.